Hello, welcome to Global Business. It's another edition of the program that makes you tick when it comes to business. I am Imewari Uhiyomokai. Today on the program, we shall be looking at the issues of tax. Last week, we looked at taxing uh, the informal sector. Of course, we looked at countries like Tanzania, Kenya, and Ghana. Now, let's come to Nigeria with a new financial act 2020. What does it mean for businesses? So we're going to the streets and our correspondent, Andrew Akbeji, went to the streets and he talked with people who know how this tax is hurting them or actually blessing them. Let's take a listen at what they had to say. Have you missed out on any of the editions of Global Business? Then what are you waiting for? Visit our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash global business on AIT to catch up on all episodes of Global Business. Also, do follow us on Twitter at Ime Ohio and our Facebook page, Global Business on AIT, for more info on Global Business. You can also send us a mail, globalbusinessonait at gmail.com for feedback and inquiries. This year, it's bigger and better. Cinema Production, in collaboration with Fears Media, brings you a classic music video promo. Is it gospel? Secular hip hop? Afrobeats, all music genres. We've got you fully covered. Shoot your musical video for 75,000 naira only. Oh my goodness. Get absolute value from our promo package as we send you on your way to stardom. With a cryptic clear video, high definition quality, best, best creative concept, all at an affordable price. Call us on 0905-1924-416 or 0701-0612-949 Send in your songs today as we create mad visuals for your hit music. Terms and conditions apply. Well, they just started the VAT increase, so it hasn't really played out into what we're doing. But then again, with the prices from um, the people we buy things, materials from, have increased. We, the vendors, we can't just increase prices like that. So we are looking at how to check the balances at the end of the month, but then we cannot be able to count our losses and gains, you know. But so far, we're trying to manage the cost and all that. We can't really say for now. We just started. Um, it's been one of mixed feelings. The customers are threatening that we should increase the food prices of food, but they know also that the fat increase is there. You know, everybody's paying it and all that. So, but like I said, it's just starting off. So, but over the long run, we'll all be able to come to accept it and all that. Patron is okay. The bad thing has not really affected it much. I think people are still just getting used to it. We are the ones who are concerned about it because, I mean, the middle and small scale businesses are the real employers of labor. And um, with this increase, it, without any incentives by the side to cushion it, you know, it goes a long way to affect the way uh, we do business. But let's see how it all plays out at the end of the day. Nobody was expecting the VAT increase the way it came in and then um, we have been experiencing difficulties with uh, most customers and then some. Some understand uh, since it's a general thing so but I think uh, we'll say majority of uh, customers who have these days uh, it has not been fine. Uh, People have not been happy with it, so and it's affecting our business. The customer reaction, uh, we'll say most of them are not happy with the VAT uh, increase because um, some will tell you we are still struggling with the five percent now, seven point five, and then you know even some will even have to turn down the uh, goods they want to buy because of the VAT. Well, nobody likes paying VAT if you have a choice. Nobody likes paying tax. But what will encourage one to pay tax is when you realize your benefit, what you stand to benefit. So at the end of the day, for me, payment of tax is like a contribution. You know, like this thing you do PPP, 
you bring a part, a smaller part, and then we'll do a bigger uh, thing project for you. So, um, and for not to pay tax, you're only building the company for future because the, the person will end up paying more. If we help the person at the initial stage and he needs all the capital, he needs to conserve and preserve all that he can at the time that helps him grow. And by the time he grows, he starts paying and you end up getting more. My concern is what do I get for paying tax? What, what is in it for me? Since whatever you are buying is something you're going to resell, and the end user is supposed to be the one to pay the tax. So, why do we keep repeating the tax? At the point I go to buy, I pay tax. When I import goods, I pay tax in addition to custom duty. And I mean VAT. And when you come back here, you pay, you expect the customer to pay VAT again. For me, it's, it's, and it is the end user that ends up paying all of those taxes. Because the VAT I pay at any point, I add it to the cost of the item, and then the same end user comes to buy and pays tax, in addition to the taxes I had already paid, and what does this end user get in return? Out there, at the end of every year, this is January, this is February now, right? There in the States, January, February, March, every year, every American look towards to that, because that is when they get what is called tax return. And just as the name goes, tax return, government returns cash, liquid cash, to her citizens. Whichever way you want it, they can make a check to your house, they can make a direct deposit to your bank account, returning the taxes that were deducted from your source. So every American look towards to that. And you see their lives, they change cars, they buy furniture, they do things, they pay their mortgages and all that with that. But for us, what do we get? All you get is just pay, pay, pay. At the end of the day, Americans collect taxes. Look at the cars we import into this country. 10 years old car, 15 years old car, come in here, look like new. You drive the car two years, it's gone. Why? Because the roads are not built. And that's what the Americans use the money to do for you. They collect money from you in the name of tax, and they use it to make your life bearable, to make your life good. Far as I'm concerned, government is not doing us any favor providing the things we ask for infrastructure security job they are not they owe us that we as nigerian citizens have the right to demand and that's what we do we demand those services we pay tax you add tax to other revenues the money you get from oil the money you get from wherever you add it to it and you use it to render the services bring about infrastructure that's the purpose of paying tax asking me to make a little contribution to what Common pause to our common pause. I should make a little contribution, and you will use it to bring the infrastructure that is needed, bring security, provide job, reduce unemployment. You owe us that, and we must continue to demand that. It does not matter what happens; they will demand for that. It's our right. You are in government today. Tomorrow, you, yesterday you were not in government. Tomorrow you won't be in government. You will be in my position, and you will demand the same. When you were not in government, you enjoy that. Most of these people rule us today. All enjoy free education. How much did Nigeria have then? What was our revenue then compared to what we have today and what are we getting? Now I need you to do something for me. Take a look at these pictures. You see them? Believe it or not, that is a higher institution in the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 21st day Nigeria. That's actually University of Benin campus in Benin. There is no light, no electricity, and no water. How do you expect such students to grow in a technologically driven world, a global world that is using artificial intelligence? How would you expect such students to build such a Bentley as this? How would you expect such students to grow in Nigeria today. By the time the students are out of university, a car like this <laughs> may not exist. This kind of Bentley will be more modern. But will their thoughts and attitudes be modern? These are the issues that plague us in Nigeria. And this was one of the issues that was discussed at the Lead Preno Network 
the forum which is a, a venue for leaders and entrepreneurs to come together to also catalyze young people to become leaders and entrepreneurs held recently in Abuja and the lead speaker is Dr. Tayo Adulaju, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Dr. Tayo Adulaju is uh, the Chief Operating Officer of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Brookings Institute Oku Model Economic Fellow of the Africa and Middle East, Senior Executive Fellow, John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Tayo holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Global Leadership and Management, focusing on the African leadership practice of economic policy and public administration. Tayo is a catalyst, facilitator, and primer of a productive, powerful, prosperous, peaceful, digitally connected, and technologically enabled industrial Africa and the third world. Tayo Adulodu, the guest speaker, spoke on various issues. He looks at the outlook for 2020, Nigeria's economy, and looks at what Nigeria should be looking at to have a best possible scenario. In fact, he's one of the speakers who you will sit, relax, and enjoy his talk, but soak it in, because what he says actually does make a lot of sense. Please listen. This is possible to us now. Okay, so in spite of all the uh, doomsday prophecies, and uh, all oh, this is possible to us now, and every entrepreneur should be an active part of the engine making this happen. Either you're driving, either you're creating an enterprise that can support this, or you're clustering yourselves into enterprise blocks that can act together. Okay, so there are some broad actions we need. The, the national strategies and agendas for growth has to happen in Abuja, but also regional strategies have to emerge. Nigeria is too big for a, for a, a, a unitary strategy in Abuja to drive everything we are doing. Let's not kid ourselves. Rice producing states have to get together. You need <coughs> at least 500 new rice mills this year. The people that produce rice should be the ones discussing where to site the mills. Yeah. It shouldn't be somebody in Abuja who doesn't have a clue, you right? right? So what we are saying is, look, get rice producing states, get together. How many million, <coughs> how much million capacity do you need? Okay, can we build it amongst ourselves and share it as a, as a million hub somewhere in the middle of the River Niger Bay State? There, there, are, there are 14 states, by the way, that are the major rights for this system because they're what we call plain states, right? Then there are 10 states on the Lakaji Corridor. All the 10 states on the Lakaji Corridor share a rail that runs through all their states, which means their capacity to take a product and deliver it through that is very, very, very high. Again, we need to ask the question, what regional strategies we build, we build around this? We build processing centers, we build new markets, or are we building straight for export? Okay, so that's, that's two minutes gone in my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do we build for that or build for something else? So we need to think about sectoral plans, not in this theoret model that lacks entrepreneurial spirit, but sectoral plans driven by us that understand it, us that understand business. You know, I keep saying to policymakers, you're not a businessman, okay? So what you do in certain reform objectives requires a business side yes. to explain what doesn't work on our balance sheets, what kills our businesses and what stops us from employing people, right? And so we have to be a bit more aggressive about entering that conversation. Education reforms and training, you know, um, I'm so glad we're discussing training um, when you came in, because that's a big part of the skills we need and the skills we want are not the same thing. Nigeria needs a wake up call. We like all these sexy things, you know. Um, everybody suddenly wants to be a hacker, they don't know what hacking means, you know. And everybody suddenly wants to be a, a programmer and they don't know what programming means. Not all of us can be programmers, none of us have the aptitude to be great programmers, okay. So, 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 so we need a set of tools that work. One of the best things we've noticed, and I was saying this to the World Bank and the Minister of Education people, is that the most successful vocational training model in Nigeria is run in the southeast. Well, yes. 
Okay. In fact, what accounts for out of school children in the South is are boys that have refused. You must understand. If they have refused to go to school, you cannot inspire them to go to school because going to school it was broke. Yes. Yeah. For them, the, the distance between where they are and wealth is the apprentice system yes. that guarantees a combination of business knowledge, mm -hmm. technical knowledge, market exposure, me radical aggressive mentoring plus discipline, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And at the right time, graduation plus exceed money. Then somebody is telling me you're bringing one vocational something from Malaysia or something. Hey, we don't need any. We, we see we have things that work. Yeah. Now the challenge is how do you give them literacy in that system? Yeah. You know, rather than bring that system to you. So the argument we are having with government is that look, out of school children is not the same. In the north, it's driven by a different factor. You have young girl wives, okay? And if the schools are not female schools with female principals or female teachers, they won't go. But it's not even they won't go, their husbands won't let them go, okay? So we different, different, and there's a whole different model. That's why I said regional agendas need to emerge. So that we are dealing with things that are commensurate to the regional response requirement. So, it's like brains. All you Southerners get to it. You will never be competitive in grades. Because agroecological gifts, eh, divine gifts of grains, was given to the North Island. Period. You know, so when I see all these strategies for agriculture, where everyone that has gone to do grades, I'm wondering to myself, something is wrong with all of you. Okay, so we need to go back to the models where factor endowments that we are uniquely gifted with in our agroecological zones and regions. Yes. By the way, agroecological zones are not geopolitical zones. No. <laughs> All coastal states share our economic maritime zone. That's 250 nautical uh, miles coastline, 350 nautical miles seawalls. All of them can do marine aquaculture. All of them. If it gets over the exams. Okay? Now that's common to them, right? So the way we need to rethink how we approach training, education reform strategy is we need to look inwards. We need entrepreneurs to say what works here. Because if you don't work there, okay? And what works here means you're paying attention to subnational. So uh, number five is accelerated private sector enterprise development within a competitive advantage model. What do I mean? Um, competitive advantage means that there are many things, that the factors are right, right? Factor conditions are there are a lot of natural resources. What do you have? in Abuja or in your village. So for example, when Koskares, who was the master of cars in Lagos, when he was ready to do rice, he didn't attempt to do rice in, in Lagos. Lagos. He failed. Okay, so he, he, <laughs> so he went to Anambra because Anambra is a plain, is a rice plain state, yeah. right? Uh, in Anambra, you don't what, struggle to get lands that are ready for rice. In fact, you struggle with the amount of water you must keep out of the rice plantation which is what he has been tackling for the last one year now, okay? But, but that's unique to that location. So some of our entrepreneurship has to respond to what are the natural resources and what are the physical infrastructure. Let's not kid ourselves. Nandre does have physical infrastructure everywhere. So if you take an enterprise where infrastructure becomes a constraint and you don't have the resources to deal with it, it's going to be a problem for you, won't it? Yes. Then there are areas where there, we have human resource advantage and where we don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, because of our, the size of our population and the, the size of the working poor, you can mobilize large numbers of people for physical labor type work. Mm -hmm. So anything you do in that regard, 
okay, could work in the short term while you reskill them for the long term, okay? But then, of course, there are issues of administrative structure. We need to fix government, okay? And there are issues of technology and technology transformation. What technology can do for you, let it do for you. That's entrepreneurship, yeah. okay? Um, and we're seeing in te that technology can work for us in, across practically every sector of the economy, whether you're in fashion, creatives, music, arts, ag, um, um, confessionary foods, uh, tech walks through. Okay, um, now, <coughs> demand conditions tell us, for those of us that are interested in ag again, I use ag just as an example, by the way, because I can't be passionate about agriculture. The supply gap on all the foods we eat means that you will not go wrong as an entrepreneur focused on closing the gap. <laughs> and nor will you go wrong raising cattle in Ekiti or anywhere that is viable, okay? If you do it differently, okay? Well, so, so we have demand conditions. We have, we have 37 million consuming class households with all the poverty. 37 million of us have the capacity to buy whatever we want to eat. What that means is that there is a market for any of those things, right? If we get to work and if we pull ourselves together, okay? Now, we have seen this work already. Look at the rice cluster, for example. You, we increased rice production. Rice production in 2016 used to be, uh, what is that? Used to be 2.3 million. By the time we got to 2017, it had jumped, right? Okay. Um, we were, we were already the largest producer of rice in West Africa. Um, and basically, where we are today, 18 producing states, 165 clusters, okay? We grew to seven, today we're at 8.3%, uh, 8.3 million um, tons of rice. Um, we have moved from dry season to dry and wet season in many states because of irrigation. So we're proving that if we focus on something, it works. All I have said, therefore, means that Nigerian entrepreneurs need to think about exponential businesses um, because growth hacking Nigeria, it cannot be done by government. Now, this idea, a government to transform the economy, is not very true. Government needs to create the policy environment and we need to help them predict and determine what that is because as you can tell, they don't know, right? We need to be smarter. We can't ask for everything, but we need to be smarter about the things we do. We can ask for the policy or policy framework that allows us to growth hack. Now, why is growth hacking necessary? Uh, because exponential organizations typically deliver in terms of impact disproportionate growth. You know, they grow in a very short time, they scale very quickly, they achieve market scale in a hurry. So idea scaling is an imperative. Why? Our size. Okay, we can't grow rice at the rate we're growing rice. Our consumption of rice this year will get to 10 million. We're at 8.3, it means nothing. Those are still giving that. And our distinguished uh, lawmakers and honorable house of reps um, that are very powerful tell us that you know, and they are not done yet. <laughs> now, now, with that type of, no, but with that type of mindset, where fertility rate is still running, it means that our, yeah, indeed, because it's a mindset, yes. and it's not a productivity mindset, right? It's a, it's a consumption mindset. Because if we had answered the question as to whether we can feed ourselves, right, before we answer the question about how many children do we want each, then we'll be asking a more responsible question. But no one cares. But we should care. But for the entrepreneur, okay, the point is how do you have ideas that scale to national market quickly, in a hurry, right? How do you get a business producing rice, for example, to move from 10 million 
tons of rice to 20 million tons of rice in one year. Those are the conversations that will transform Nigeria. Good day, dear viewer. Welcome to African Business Proverbs, where we deploy the wisdom in African Proverbs to teach life and business principles. Today, we are back to Igbo land in Nigeria. And the proverb we have says, the hunger that has hope does not kill. And this you need to think about. Think about it. How do you manage staff motivation? How do you manage selling hope to family? How do you manage national aspirations and encouraging people to keep working until you get to the goal you've set for yourself as a nation, as a family, as an institution? We recommend that you keep selling hope. You must be a purveyor of hope as a leader. You constantly keep seeing things from the brighter side, no matter what the challenges are. I would be quick to throw in a Sapele proverb. That if you don't step out of your house, you will not see the moon shining. Meaning that at every point, no matter how deep a situation you found yourself, step out. Look at the brighter side of life. Speak it. Keep encouraging people. No matter how much pain you feel in your body as an athlete, try once more. Push harder. No matter how bad the, the numbers may look in the organization, keep encouraging your staff. The next proposal, the next defense, the next innovation. As an artist, write the next song. Sing it. The next novel, write again. Go to the next publisher. No matter how much you, you are turned down, keep pushing. Keep trying until you get to it. Remember Thomas Edison. Remember how many experiments? Several. But one day, he achieved the light bulb. Keep achieving. Keep pushing till you get there. One more time. Remember, like I said, the Igbo proverb, the hunger that has hope does not kill. We wish you a very great day. Thank you. That's how we wrap it up on Global Business this week. It's been an edition that we've looked at the Financial Act 2020 in Nigeria. Last week, we looked at the tax uh, reforms in other countries. Now we looked at the ones in Nigeria. And we also listened to Dr. Tayo Adilodu at the Lipreno Network. Do join us again next week for another edition. Remember, we do business right and we do everything business. It's always nice doing business with you. I'm Imewari Uhemohai. <laughs>